This is an audio visual podcast by Benjamin Ross. Spatial planning and the Metropolitan Centre. Going back to our basics with our town and metropolitan centres. Why this podcast? Why has it come up now? And what is international best practice? And what is not international best practice when it comes to planning, designing, building and operating our town and metropolitan centres. Remember, transport begets land use, land use begets transport, but both beget the user environments in the city. So depending on how your transport and land use is done, and given that they're inter intertwined, is how the user environment will become. And your user environment is very different to an autocentric or pro-car or car-dominated centre like Monaco City Centre is currently, even as it goes through its urban renewal, to a pro-people-centric uh, town or metropolitan centre or even city centre such as we see in Europe, uh, like Paris and in East Asia. Just a bit about me, I am an urban geographer and spatial planner based here in South Auckland. Projects that I've ever advocated or influenced on include the Al Manakal Transformation Project, Airport to Botany Rapid Transit, which, which stage one is currently underway, to smaller street calming projects, including street car, uh, tactical urban, there's more to the point, such as street calming, parklets, and bus lanes. The context of this podcast is that recently I was alerted on LinkedIn to some renders by Kiwi Property. Now, Kiwi own Sylvia Park, the Sylvia Park complex, which is um, up in the Mount Wellington area. And they showed me this render of, the, of their latest town centre or metropolitan centre which they want to develop in Jury in the south, in the south of Auckland. Now, the Jury is about seven minutes away from where I am based here in Papakura. The person alerted to me to the fact that the renders were showing the main street, so what you can see here, being autocentric. That is, it looks like a run-of-the-mill New Zealand main street with cars and car parking, and you've got people mingling down it. And I was asked is why are we still doing this, which a 1960s concept, an autocentric concept, when international best practice, and ironically led not only by Paris, but also by the United States of America as they start converting their dead malls into mixed use metropolitan centers, why are we still doing this here in New Zealand when it runs against international best practice. We look at a recent study done in Victoria. So this was done pre-COVID and you can look at it post-COVID in the New Zealand sense. International best practice for town and metropolitan centres demonstrate the importance of war active modes and transit to a town or metropolitan center, in this case, Port Phillip. Businesses, including retailers and hospitality agents, believe most people will come by car and want to park, whether it will be the worker or the patron. That is incorrect. International evidence is showing that most, that most workers and residents will use transit and active modes. So much so that a centre that is pro-human centric rather than auto-centric will have an increase of takings for the retailers and hospitality agents by upwards of 34% and in some cases higher in income. And productivity, if you've got offices in the area or civic infrastructure, looking at a Transport for London study, can be upwards of 34 to 40%. This is all through using human-centric infrastructure, not auto-centric infrastructure.
So again, why are we seeing renders in places like Drury or Mokoroa in north of Tauranga, where we see town centres and metropolitan centres like this? When international best practice is saying this, walking, cycling and public transport is more preferred by residents, the workers and the patrons. As shown here from Transport for London, when it is easier to walk around a metropolitan or town centre or catch transit to it, retailers will see a 40% increase in dollars spent by said patrons each month more than car drivers. Furthermore, it also helps mitigate against online retailing. Online, online retailing is here to stay. However, online retailing does not factor in that humans, even introverts, are social creatures. We are social. We have been since inception. And as we became more specialized in our toolkit and our suite of things we want to do, and as industry began to develop, cities rose. So we could come together. But the research is showing that those who are able to walk, cycle or use transit to their local town centre or to their sub-regional metropolitan centre or further to their regional city centre spent 40% more than those who drove. And in the COVID and post-COVID economy, that 40% could mean the difference between your business surviving and your business going under. It is simple as that. Continuing on, foot traffic increased. When your foot traffic increases, you get the linger factor. People will linger. And the more safe they are, and the more secure they are in lingering, the more likely you're going to get that impulse purchase. For example, I go to a metropolitan centre that had, that I was able to access by transit and I was able to walk around freely without having to worry about cars. I start by having a lunch, probably have something to drink. Now, if I drove the car, I'm limited by drink driving and drink driving laws. I am not so bound by that walking or catching transport. Note, I do not condone public drunkenness, but you're more likely to spend more because you're not having to worry about the drink driving situation and you're also not limited by two, one, two or four hour parking. You're there from the open to close. You're only limited by the trading hours of the establishment. But because of that, I am more likely to linger post fact. And if I am likely to linger, I am likely to, um, likely to spend more through a random impulse purchase. Again, this is where your 40% comes from. You can also see the other figures in there, such as a 216% increase in activity for going into a shop, stopping at a cafe, when parking on a beach if it's beachside. Retail rental values increase. So that's more money for the retailer, but also more money for the landlord. And more likely your retail is going to be filled by businesses and you're less likely to have vacancies. No one likes vacant shops. Yet active and transit centers that can be accessed properly by active and transit modes are less likely to have vacancies compared to a main street dominated by cars. So the spatial planning question becomes, if international literature, northern and southern hemisphere, east and west, so it's universal, the international literature is showing that town and metropolitan centres will increase. They have an increase of 40% in their revenue through our spend, thanks to, those, thanks to those active and transit modes. Then why are planners and engineers and developers still engaging in auto-centric planning? Why are you doing this? And don't say you're serving a rural catchment. It doesn't fly. 
because if you are also serving a rural catchment, at which they do have to drive that, it's understandable, they park on the fringe. They park on the fringe of the centre, and they can either walk or catch transit, readily available transit, to its core. There's no need for them to come in by car into the core. None whatsoever. You park on the fringe, and then use your active and transit modes to come to the core, if you are a rural customer. So I do acknowledge our rural folk. Spatial planning 101. Using the methods and approaches by the public and private sector to influence the distribution of people and activities at various scales. From regional to sub-regional to local to site specific. Goes up and down the lot. And spatial planning also looks at the way we should deal with things more than simply zoning and land use or the design of the physical form. But you're also looking at the spatial relationships, the human relationships, the employments, the homes and the leisure uses. So it combines the physical with the human. So as a spatial planner, this is what I do. I use spatial planning to influence the sectors so that when they do their developments, it then influences the distribution of the people and the activities of those spaces at whatever scale it may be, regional to site specific, because I am not only looking at land use and the physical form, I am also looking at the relationship. And if the relationship is telling me that there is a 40% increase in spend by patrons like myself in retail and hospitality agents, because the physical form has active and transit modes over autocentric modes over the car, then that should be telling me when I do my next town centre, new or retrofitting, that I should be rinsing and repeating, see now you've got standardisation kicking in, of making sure that the prevailing form is backed by active modes, and transit modes. Going to Monaco as an example. So now we're going to look at Monaco city centre, the core of southern Auckland, New Zealand, Auckland and New Zealand's largest and fastest growing sub-region, pre-COVID, COVID and post-COVID. So it doesn't matter which year of the COVID are then, it still applies until we see what the census data shows us in a few years' time, because they were able to normalise it out and remove any spikes or drops. But Monaco was designed, as we know, in the 1960s as an autocentric city centre, second city centre to serve the industrialising self. And in 2015, the Al Monaco urban renewal regime kicked over at the behest of Auckland Council, with Panuku Development Auckland leading or being its main steward. Rather ironically, whether it was through design or unintentional, Monaco's grid street pattern allows for very easy retrofitting from car spaces to people spaces. Monaco might seem cursed at the moment with its wide four-lane boulevards with large grass medians, but they also act as a blessing as well to convert it into people spaces, especially in its core. This is Monaco in 1959, so a couple of years before it develops. Wurri Station Road, Ross Common Road, Pua Nui Road, Plunkett Avenue, Druces Road, Great South Road, Southern Motorway, which only went up to Redout Road at the time. In there would be Monaco. Also in here would be the Southwestern Motorway State Highway 20. This is Monaco as of 2019 when the last Google satellite shot was. Uh, the Auckland, last Auckland Council aerial shot was either a similar period or in 2018. But you can see the motorway. You can see the four-lane wide boulevards. You can also see the two-lane boulevards, Romwood Avenue and Davis Avenue. But you will notice it is in a grid street pattern and there's also a road hierarchy in place. Despite it being autocentric at the moment, 
Monaco actually has a proper hierarchy in place. Motorway on the fringe for interregional traffic. Four lane arterials around the primary core to carry thoroughfare traffic either to Manukau or through Manukau to another destination. Two lane boulevards to bring the traffic off the four laners and into the core itself. And then your little intricate laneways which have cars on them at the moment that weave in between the spatial form. Monaco has its hierarchy. She is blessed that way, which makes it straightforward to retrofit and to bear um, minimal inconvenience to residents and businesses in the area. Looking at, so with the Panuku work, we are now looking at some plans to draw and we've got some, some perceptions and conceptions versus reality. This is Monaco Station Road, although there's now a bus lane in place. It was added on recent before after the shot was taken. And this is what they want to turn it into. I think they're going with with A to B airport to Botany, not in this particular area. Asymmetrical would be best. So it would be down here. And this side will be freed up as active modes. But where airport to Botany runs, it would be best to run it as it is right now and bus lanes either side. Sorry, this one. So you run with both. Putney Way, bit of a letdown. Perception or concept, reality. In reality, those cars should not be there at all. It's showing the exact same as we go back. As Drury, no better. It's no better. This is a people space. You've got mixed use buildings on one side with Putney Way, and you've got the transport station and an incoming hotel on the other. So, why are cars on, and no buses use this? The buses go around. And if they're not, they definitely should be using Monaco Station Road to access the entrance of the station. But why are these cars here? They shouldn't be. Yes, it's open for goods vehicles, but it shouldn't be open to cars. Perception versus reality. Barrowcliff. This is currently being done at the moment. This is stitching up with... It has to form a second entrance to the new development down here. Otherwise, you only have one way in, one way out, which is not safe. But this is the road. A slow road. Cycleway. Footpath. So, we'll connect up this residential area. Three stories up. And this will stitch it up into Monaco City Centre itself. Now, ironically... It also, so if I go back, it's down here. So we'll go into the Osterly Way, Sharky Way spine. And it's one of the areas which I would humanize. Citizen democracy works. Now I'm going to bring in some citizen democracy. Citizen democracy works. Basically, badger your public institutions long and hard enough with solid, robust evidence and a good solid story, and they'll go and do it. For example, this lane here, and it's been just done recently, used to be a general lane. And what would used to happen is the cars would come round and enter this lane and then run into the bus lane either adversely or inadvertently and get pinged. And there were a lot of complaints. So I went back to Auckland Transport and says, look, this is going to continue and you're not going to get support for any more bus lanes in the area because there's meant to be another bus lane coming back this way and there'll be more bus lanes here and here with A to B as that comes online next year. Why don't we make this a bus lane? So general traffic sticks to the right-hand lane and this becomes a bus lane, feeds straight into here and then straight down here. So, but your cars aren't inadvertently landing in the bus lane unless they are doing it through recklessness. What I'm trying to do, rather than enforcing by fines or punitive fines, I'm trying to encourage through design. And this it will become apparent or reinforced when you do other works in the area. So, through design, I've taken cars out of, out of what would become a bus lane so they don't inadvertently run into another that is enforced. 
and at the same time the buses now have free access into that before going into the station. So if you can encourage behaviour by design rather than enforcing behaviour through regulation and punitive measures, you will usually get support for further uh, renewal projects in the area, which is what I'm, tr which is what I want to do and encourage and drive with Panuku. So citizen democracy works. So now we get on to spatial planning and citizen, citizen democracy. So now blending citizen democracy and spatial planning. Let me use this example of Monaco of going from autocentric to human centric. So through drawing these designs, these very crude mocked up designs, and blending and then using citizen democracy to push it with the public sector, while storytelling it to the private sector to get them on the side, let's see how we can bring the two, planning and democracy, together to help Monaco become people-centric in the post-COVID era. Let's take a look at those drawings. So basically using A3 butter paper, with a photo underneath, I drew up the basic road layout of the Monaco City Centre core area. As I said earlier, she has her road hierarchy already in place, and it is a grid street pattern, which makes Monaco one of the easiest metropolitan centres and one of the three nodes in Auckland to retrofit. Designed in the 1960s as autocentric, this grid pattern would actually become a blessing in the 21st century. So again, you can see the hierarchy, the motorway, the four laners, the two laner, bringing it into the core herself, and then your smaller laneways off that. Of course, this is Heyman Park, the bus station, the rail station, and when A to B Airport to Botany comes along, it will come along through here at this point in time, alongside the 33 Great South Road bus. So what do we do to humanise it off? Well, first of all, I had to recognise where A to B was going. That had to be done first. And then it was some very simple, either closing entrances off, closing roads off, or closing part of a wide boulevard off to turn them into human spaces. Now, in doing so, no business is affected by removing the cars out of them at all. Access to car parks are still maintained. Wrongwood Avenue is still two lanes. And if you need to drop in a bus lane to serve the 33, the 361 and the airport link, then you can repurpose the black areas which would be closed off. And at the remember for, for Arisham Way, Leeton Way, Putney Way and Osterley Way, these can still be accessed by service vehicles between 6 and 11 a.m. Monday to Sunday. So their access is never lost, but we are taking the cars out there to stitch up the fabric, more stations to MIT, Hotel going in here, hotel going in there. So you're stitching the fabric up. This gets turned into a boulevard because that would allow stitching over to the car park, which is due to go into development in the future as soon as Westfield are ready to do so. Finally, oh, not finally, sorry. Closing wrong, this large chunk of Wrongwood off and turning it into a boulevard means also that you've got a active mode stitching up between the Great South, well, as close to the Great South Road as possible, along the front of most of the retailers and, and hospitality in this area, up to Lambie Drive, which already has cycle lanes in place. All they need is their concrete uh, barriers to make them grade separated. Not much money. And the thing is, doing this is not expensive. It's actually quite cheap. You're just repurposing. You're not having to rebuild. 
you're just repurposing a lot of existing infrastructure, which can be done quite cheaply. Yep, might mean start with the plastic and then move your way to the concrete and the planters as money allows. So this would not cost much money at all to the council. Very little, in fact. In fact, it could be even covered with targeted rates. Finally, between Arisham Way and Leeton Way, you've got uh, Melbourne, Krispy Kreme, and those hospitality places up here, and the entrance to the Mormon Farm is here. This small stretch would serve as a mini hub for the three buses, so people, because you've got one here, so you would drop another one in here to, so people can access everything in there. And what you've basically done is then turn Romwood into a mixed mall. So general down one side with buses for the moment, active modes down the other, and if it ever needs to be, you can flip it over into a transit wall. And here it is in written form here. So the existing cycleways go grade protected. The sections of these roads here are converted into pedestrian small to stitch up the urban fabric. And now most of these places either have residential, hospitality, or retail. And remember, we spend more by 40% at a minimum if it is active modes or transit modes in those areas rather than the car. Several sides of the Monaco entrances on Monaco Station Road would be closer to that better continuity of the bus lanes. Uh, the three, um, sorry, the three, 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 six, six, and the three, five use those particular areas, so they would be better served. Of course, again, that minibus hub and Romwood Avenue still keeps her two general lanes, so you're not losing road space, anyone. But we've just converted the other side into active modes and, if necessary, a transit mall. But Romwood Avenue becomes a basic area. And again, this would not cost much money. You could probably get it under 30 million done right. And it would be defined as tactical urbanism, which has been done a huge push by NZTA. Hint, hint, NZTA. If you want to do a tactical urbanism in, the, in South Auckland, here we are right here. If we look at Romwood Avenue, this on-street parking is not needed. It's paid parking. There is a AT parking building 100 metres up the road, protected from the elements. So you can, can easily convert this to two lanes, one way, one, one way, one the other, so you're not losing any lanes. And this side would initially become one big active mode boulevard. However, if need be, for the airport link, it could be flipped over into a transit mall. So no existing road space has disappeared. It's just being repurposed. Tactical urbanism. And you've got the cycleways there, 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 and actually just a bit up there. Put in your rubber to start with, your plastic and your rubber to start with, and go to concrete once A to B is all formalized and all done up. As Strong Towns would point out, cities are divided into neighbor neighborhoods. Ever spent time living in a walkable one without a car? You know it's dependent on your amenities. But remember, transport begets land use, land use begets transport, both beget the user environment. This is what we're trying to achieve with Monaco. A complete Neighbourhood. This is what Drury should be achieving. I should not see cars anywhere near a main street in Drury. Yes, they are on Romwood Avenue, but that's because of how the driveways are sitting. But they would not be on the laneways like Putney Way, Ossley Way, Armishan Way. They've been taken out. Leeton Way. Remember, active modes. Spend. 40% more. That 40% can be the difference between your business surviving or going under post-COVID. It also allows the complete package. Walkable, mixed use, safe, schools, parks, childcare, community. Remember, Monaco is a metropolitan centre. Juries to be a town centre or a metropolitan centre. They service sub-regional Catchments. In fact, Monaco services an interregional catchment. 
and affordable housing options, especially in this economy post COVID. Most of all, humanizing it, I get to enjoy that bear without the sight of traffic fumes and noise. I couldn't think of anything worse than sitting on a main street, having that bear on, on a winter or summer's afternoon because you dress to the weather and having cars rumble by every couple of seconds and all those fumes and all that noise. I couldn't think of anything worse. No wonder why I'm not going to spend money there or even linger. Take them out. I get to linger. Enjoy my hospitality. I'm likely to spend that 40% more, which goes to the workers and goes to the owner. For more information, or if you'd like to have a discussion or open a dialogue, I can be reached at ben at colab.nz. My LinkedIn profile is as below. This has been an audio visual podcast on spatial planning and the metropolitan and town centres. Why are we seeing autocentric designs from the 1960s and new designs in the 21st century in New Zealand when international best practice is showing that it should be active modes and transit modes with the consummate quince being those centres with those modes rather than autocentric, the patrons are likely to spend 40% more. The difference between your business surviving or going under post-COVID.